to everyone, I would like to thank you. So I require my students <laughs> and ask my colleagues in the lab. And uh, I also welcome other students for coming in. And also my students in my Bio 199 seminar. Thank you all very much. Please, uh, we have a good number here you know, so that I can share with you what uh, we have done for this uh, Asia Pacific Network funded project on value energy. So I would like to mention my uh, research team. First is Dr. Niki Beth Acosta, who is from, um, at that time when we, when we conducted this project, was uh, connected with Potsdam Institute in Germany. Now currently she is with the um, Green Global Initiative, GGI, in South Korea. Yes. And then Dr. Kavi Kumar is a professor of economics uh, in India, in Madras School of <coughs> Economics. Uh, Dr. Su Peng Ki Kui is also an economist and a modeler uh, from um, Beijing Institute of Technology in China. But I think now he is based in, uh, in Ireland. Okay, and then the local research team are Elena Eugenio, Paula Beatriz Macando, Dr. Arnold Salvation, and Gimano Di Aquino. So this is the title of my, my paper which I presented in London last year. And I was very lucky to be awarded you know, by the Circa Travel Grant. And in exchange for that, I have to present this paper here locally at Circa. Okay. So, okay. So, by energy. Okay. So just uh, for introductory, just to level up. Okay. I just want to define bioenergy. So this is the energy from biomass. And it could either be raw biomass or processed biomass. So if you've been to our countryside, so you know it's very common you know, in, in the provinces that they just use pieces of wood or branches so that's basically raw biomass that is being used for cooking and heating. Okay? And the other one is processed biomass. So can be processed certain um, species of biomass for bioethanol or biodiesel. So here in the Philippines, we use sugar cane for bioethanol production and we use our coconut oil for biodiesel. So that's processed biomass. And um, as I have mentioned, we use sugar cane and coconut oil. These are basically feedstuff. This is the raw material that's being used for um, processing um, biofuel. Okay. And we have first generation, second generation feedstuff. The first generation feedstuff, basically these are the crops that are being used for food, like our sugar cane. A coconut oil for cooking. So, and then a non liquid biomass like Jadropa is also uh, considered as a first generation. Second generation uh, feedstock would be biomass leaves, crop residues, and trees and shrubs. They are second generation. Okay, so, I mentioned all this because our study will revolve uh, really around these um, preferences for feedstock among the three uh, study countries in Asia. Okay. So policies promoting bioenergy has different uh, focal objectives for different countries, but these four are the most common for climate change mitigation, rural development, energy security, and for trade and economic growth. Okay, so this one I just want to show you the global production. So for bioethanol since 2001, it has increased from 20 to 50 in, and in 2014, 94 billion liters of production globally. And for biodiesel, it started with, it's smaller, less as compared with bioethanol, 0.8 billion liters in 2001, it rose to 4 and then to 30 in the 2013. And the, the graph there on the right side shows you the different um, producers, and of course, US would be the highest producer for biodiesel. And then we have other countries like Brazil, Germany, France, Netherlands, and mostly European countries. Okay, so, and uh, in most of um, these countries, um, it's the security for energy. Energy security is one of the most Open cited policy objectives for bioenergy development. Okay, because we have experienced that we have these public concerns on energy security due to short term volatility of prices. So you will always see that in the news that tomorrow the price of our oil will increase, and then the next day, and then let's, let's say next week there's a, a decrease, but then the following day there is a, again 
an increase in the process. So it's really very volatile. And we know that fossil fuels, are, they are not renewable. So it, it, it's, um, it is definite stuff. And then if we continually mine this, if we continually extract this from, from the earth, we will come up and there will be a shortage of uh, this fossil fuel. So the long-term supply of fossil fuels is, uh, is a questionable one. Actually, in Dubai, uh, they know that, the United Arab Emirates, they know that maybe in the next 50 years, they still have a supply of fossil fuel. But after that, there will be no more supply. So what's, the, what's their strategy now? If you notice it in Dubai, they are developing tourist destinations because that is their long-term goal. That's a long-term goal of their king uh, to make Dubai as a tourist destination in the future. Just like in Europe now, but it's a tourist destination. It's a major um, economic um, source of economy, source of income for the European countries. So for Dubai, that's also their, uh, their, their projection in the future because of the um, long-term supply of fossil fuel is a very big question mark. It will decrease in the future. Okay. And we know that um, this long-term supply of fossil fuels uh, will destabilize the economy. Because if you let a fossil fuel, then uh, the economy, the factories, the cars, we won't have um, fossil, we won't have fuel for them. So that's why alternative um, energy sources it's a big thing in most of the countries, not only developed countries, but also economies in transition as well as developing economies. Okay, so global bioenergy trade is not limited only for biofuels, but also feedstock. Okay, so like in the Philippines, we export feedstock, okay, but not the, the, the biofuel. And you know when you just export the unprocessed feedstock, uh, you you have only very little profit. Whereas if you if you export the processed one, you have a greater margin for profitability. Okay. Now, on the other side of the coin, bioenergy trade also has undesirable impacts, not only on specific communities due to social displacement. Why social displacement? Because, for example, this area is being um, used by, let's say, the local communities for, let's say, agroforestry system or for the planting system. If it's going to be converted to, let's say, plantation, bus plantations of sugar, sugar oil, not sugar palm, that's what is happening now in Mindanao, in Abusande. So, so the local communities are being displaced. So not only in the Philippines, the same trends are also happening in China. So social displacement due to conversion of their farms into plantation for bioenergy is also a, a major issue. Okay. So and uh, not only social displacement but also the entire population of these countries face the threat of food security. Because instead of the crop being used for food, it's being used for bioenergy. Okay. So the controversies on the impacts of bioenergy production on food availability and affordability, because if there is less of supply then um, following the law of supply and demand, the prices will go up. Okay? So it will make food security as one of the most urgent contemporary public issues. Okay? And so the conversion of these agricultural crops and lands from food to bioenergy production has been claimed to contribute to short supply and thus high prices of major food commodities. And we have experienced that with our sugar cane. Okay, so there was a time that much of our sugar cane uh, produce has been used for uh, bioethanol production and the price of our sugar shoot up. Okay, so we are the ones uh, being affected, the consumers. Okay, so this apparent conflict between manufacturing and food production as well as increased food prices have been described as food versus fuel debate. So it's a global debate. Okay. Rapid price increases in food commodities have considerable negative impacts on poverty reduction. And we know that poverty reduction is number two in the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, okay? uh, and also um, to reduce hunger. So these are interlocked because of the reduced supply of uh, these crops for food consumption. Okay? And this undermines rural development in many developing countries, including the Philippines. Okay. Only the 
first generation bioenergy foodstuff is often considered to cause a direct competition with food production. So that further development of advanced fuels from being edible, which is say second, okay, uh, second generation and is being encouraged. But if we take a closer look, the use of such non-food crops, the use of such second generation crops also compete with food for land and water use. But thus ultimately these second generation crops also cause a decline in resources that should have been available for food production. So in either way, that means in either way, kahit first generation or second generation, it would still have negative impact on food production because it will require land resources, water, and other resources to grow these uh, second generation crops. Okay. Now, this one, I just want to show you. Okay, so we just focus on China, India, and Philippines. So for bioethanol production, so for bioethanol production in, in China, corn, wheat, and cassava are being used. And for biodiesel, it's waste vegetable oil. Okay. Here in the Philippines, we do not use our waste vegetable oil. You know, that's one of my research that I'm thinking of, but then I didn't get funding for this. So, but I have already had initial discussion with them. Then, uh, you know, we have lots of jollity, KFC, and then uh, one that means, you know, yung, um, yung waste and oil. Man. So, and then if we can convert that into biodiesel, that's a good resource no, for, for us. So, and I think that our government should uh, start thinking on using this uh, waste. Okay, in India, for bioethanol molasses, okay, Jetrofa, okay, so that's why we have a big project on Jetrofa more than 10 years ago, you know, and our uh, university officials even went to India you know, to, to, to learn from the Jetrofa uh, growing and then processing of, of oil from Jetrofa and then on campus. In the Philippines, sugar cane. For bioethanol and for biodiesel, we use coconut oil. So both of both of these are food crops. Okay, so first generation feedstocks. Okay, so going back to my introduction. In addition to land and water competition between fuel and food production, the widespread system of bioenergy production is causing degradation of the ecosystem. Why? Because we have to apply only we have to cultivate, we have to apply fertilizer, we have to apply pesticides, we have to, and all of this may lead to a degradation of the system. Now this photo here is I got it from the internet but this is the oil palm plantation in Agusa del Sur in Mindanao. So many of the areas in there are being converted into this monoculture um, planting of um, oil palm. Okay. Now, what else? Agriculture, okay, requires 70% of the total global water usage, okay. And with increased biofuel production, it is ambition, it is computed that it can go up to 90%. That means to say, there is a very high requirement for fresh water, no, for for this biofuel and food production. And then there is a pesticide, as I mentioned earlier, fertilizer, okay are being done to increase land productivity and this, this will cause also more water pollution, you know that. So not only pollution but it also uh, affect uh, biodiversity. Okay, so if you if your water bodies are polluted with these um, pesticides it might affect you no know, even yung, yung mga very young fish and shrimp and other uh, aquatic uh, biodiversity um, species. Okay. The dramatic increase in bioenergy production in recent years was achieved through conversion of forests into monoculture of soybean, sugarcane, corn, or oil palm oil plantations. Okay. Now, on the other side, because forests play an important role in storing carbon that is otherwise emitted into the atmosphere, again, this is one of the SDGs. Okay. The climate mitigation objective of bioenergy has been related through large scale deforestations because instead of sequestering carbon and then so it is offset by a greater amount of carbon dioxide being emitted into the atmosphere because of deforestation. So the bioenergy production is very complicated no? if you look at it at different angles. <clears throat> okay, energy security, food security, and ecosystem capacity are very much interlinked. Okay? There is thus an inherent trade-offs among them. So if you want to increase bioenergy, you might 
there might be a negative impact on food production and also on the ecosystem. Okay. These trade-offs are implicitly taken into account in nexus studies, where the word nexus simply means a connection or series of connections linking two or more things. So in here, in the diagram, I'm showing you water, energy, and food nexus. Okay. Understanding the form of trade-offs can help avoid the selection of extreme management policies which can result from considering smaller numbers of objectives and thus ignoring the real system complexity. Moreover, understanding the conflicts due to these trade-offs is particularly important for understanding welfare impacts, coping mechanisms, and environmental feedback effects at the local level. The study of energy food ecosystem nexus thus helps to inform about the need for not only a redirection in government policy, but also a change in societal behavior. Okay, so our study was to determine public perceptions in some sort of a behavioral economic system you know, on sustainable bioenergy and how they influence the preferences for alternative feedstock and the underlying sustainability of the Okay, so what did we do? Okay, so most of my um, collaborators in the project from Germany, from India, from China, they're all economists, I am ecologists. So I, I invited Kaling this morning, Kaling, you come to my seminar this afternoon because he is an economist and he knows where the conjoint analysis. If they ask something about conjoint analysis, I will ask Kaling to answer that one. But for the others, let me answer <laughs> later. Okay, so this the analysis is based on a choice-based conjoint survey of respondents in three countries, Philippines, India, and China. Okay. And we, in, we surveyed different <coughs> members of the society. We, in, we surveyed, interviewed public employees, officials, private company employees, managers, academics, researchers, farmers, agricultural workers. And then we grouped all of these respondents into two, those related to agriculture and those non-agriculture professions. So we tried to compare the, their preferences between the agriculture and non-agriculture respondents. Okay, so what is conjoint choice analysis? And analysis is a practical technique for measuring preferences. So we ask them what's your choice, what's your preference, which one will you, will you choose, will you prefer, and assessing the trade-off among these decisions. Okay. Um, the conjoint choice analysis is widely used in different scientific fields, psychology, economics, and the environment to transform subjective choice responses into estimated parameters. So that's when the economic analysis comes in there. In conjoint analysis, the attributes of an environmental good are used to understand the general trade-offs which an individual is willing to make. Okay. So, and then, just to take note that these preferences, we all know that, okay? These are our choices, our preferences, that we think of it. They are influenced by our subjective perceptions and our economic, social, and cultural conditions, okay? So, in this uh, analysis, in this choice-based content analysis, a set of attributes and the respective levels define the respondents' choices, okay? Specifically, the combinations of attribute levels define the choice tasks. I will give example later, virtually, in conjoint surveys and are thus the four elements in conjoint analysis. Okay. Now, our framework is this one. We make it struct. Sustainability, trade-offs, and pathways. Struct. Okay. And that's the name of our project, Big Struct. Okay. It takes into account the conceptual interconnections and interdependencies between the indicators. Okay, for example, okay, we have here attributes, economic stability. Okay, what are the determinants okay, of economic stability? Okay, so we have energy security, technology progress, market organization. For social equity, okay, we have food security, social welfare, social justice, ecological balance, production potential ecosystem capacity, and land management. 
And then for the indicators, okay, these are the levels uh, of these different determinants. Okay, so for example, okay, these are uh, the attribute levels. Okay, so let's say for economic stability, so we have to eat. Energy security, technology progress, and market organization. Now for energy security, we have three okay, attribute levels. Domestic energy demand, domestic energy supply, and the foreign energy trade. Okay. For technology progress, we have three attribute levels. The R&D investment of the country, technology deployment, and energy efficiency. Market organization, what are the market incentives, market infrastructure, and the trade constraints. In the middle one, we have social equity. So we have three, um, we have food security, social welfare, and social justice. For food security, the three attribute levels are food self-sufficiency, purchasing power of the people, and affordability of the food. And then the second determinant would be social welfare. So the three attribute levels are livelihood sources, job opportunities, household lifestyle. And the third determinant, social justice. The attribute level, <coughs> equal property rights, home displacement, land dispossession. For ecological balance, the dominance, uh, first one, production potential. So the attribute levels are the potential level and the feedstock sources. Okay. So that will be first generation or second generation feedstock. And then for ecosystem capacity, the three attribute levels are effects of population pressure, the pressure on natural resources, effects on landscape and species diversity. And land management, the three levels, attribute levels are the effects on nature conservation, compatibility with organic farming, and availability of good farming practices. Right. Then, okay, so basically, these are what we are um, thinking of. Let's say, let's say for energy security, <coughs> domestic energy demand, more desirable will be the domestic energy demand is low. Less desirable is when there is high domestic energy demand. Here's the problem is to supply this one. For the domestic energy supply, a more desirable scenario would be we have high, we have plenty of energy, and there is, uh, and the low, the less desirable scenario is there is very low <coughs> energy supply. Okay, it's not enough to supply the, the demands of the society. Foreign energy trade, a more desirable would be for economic stability, you have low import, okay? And less desirable would be high export, okay? For technology progress, of course, for the three attribute levels, it should be high. High R&D investment, plenty of um, government funding for that one, technology deployment, and for energy efficiency, it's high also. And the less desirable scenario would be low on this. For market organization, the market incentive, more desirable would be high market incentive, less desirable would be low market incentive. Market infrastructure, good infrastructure, and for trade constraints, there is very low constraint. Okay? And the less desirable one would be the opposite. So that's the scenario for economic stability. For ecological balance, potential level, more desirable would be very high, potential level, the less desirable would be the low, or the very low or no potential. For, for feedstock sources, more desirable would be crop forest residues, fast growing trees, perennial grasses. What are these? Second generation feedstock. Less desirable is when you use starch rich crops, sugar rich crops like our sugar cane, oil rich crop like our coconut oil. Okay. Resource capacity. Effects of population pressure, okay. More desirable would be production potential is unaffected by the population pressure. Less desirable is it is affected. Pressure on natural resources, we put less pressure on natural resources. It means safe, lesser environmental degradation. If you put more pressure, it will be subject to more or greater environmental degradation. Uh, effects on landscape and species diversity, of course, a more desirable scenario would be you improve the diversity. The less desirable is you destroy or decrease in, design, in diversity. Land management, effects on nature conservation, okay, more desirable is that it supports nature conservation. 
less desirable is it is in conflict with nature conservation. Compatibility with organic par farming, a more desirable scenario is it is compatible. Availability of good farming practices, they are available. Okay, this will be more desirable. And the opposite would be the less desirable ones. Okay. For social equity, food self-sufficiency, purchasing power, affordability, in a more desirable scenario, they should all increase. The opposite will be the less desirable. Social welfare, livelihood sources, job opportunities, they will increase. Household lifestyle, it's improved. Okay, that's more desirable. For social justice, equal property rights, it supports no? equal property rights. Home displacement and land dispossession are prevented. Okay, so, okay. So what did we do for our survey design? So in Germany at Potsdam Research Institute, they have this software, okay, SSI web software software. So we just input in there, it is the one who's going to, to make, to devise all the different combinations of determinants and attribute levels for decision making. Okay, so it will construct the choice tasks. Okay, so those are the ones. The choice tasks will be a combination of different uh, choices that they have the, for economic stability, for the environment, for bioenergy, okay? And it will also be the one to prepare the conjoint questionnaire. It's a very good software. Okay. And then it, you just input in there again, we encode the survey data, and it will analyze the respondents of the, the responses of the respondents. So it has completed the decent reference weights. Okay. And then we used several ways, not because we would like to, to gather more information and to reach more respondents. So initially we use the web platform. With the web platform, we have it online, and let's say for me, I just send email addresses to all my contacts and ask them to uh, answer online. But in India, this the, did not work well, so they had so much difficulty. So what they did was to conduct um, actual survey. Okay. We did also some actual survey in in Panta Quezon and also in Lipa Batangas. Okay. In China, our um, researchers went also to the agricultural community, okay, which is the study site. I will show that one later. Okay. And then, so, online survey enables to reach different groups of respondents in different parts of the country with minimum expenses. But the problem is, you know, maybe you have that experience that when you send email messages, and you are asking for them to answer for the survey, you get very, very low responses. Even if you follow it up, but they are not interested. Whereas if you go there and really interview them one on one, they have no other choice but to answer the question. So it's a combination of that one. We even contacted heads of institutions, okay, and asked them to, to disseminate the survey questionnaire to their staff and so on. Okay, so it's a combination of that one online web and then later on we have offline so we just have our tablet and then we have our researchers um, doing the actual interview okay so this is an example of choice tasks that the software this uh, software software will use okay so i'll just read that one okay so it's really quite a bit confusing and you really have to take some time with your uh, respondents for them to really think about it Okay, so let's say in this part of the survey, we provide you different imaginary economic conditions to develop bioenergy production. Given these conditions, which type of biomass would you choose to produce bioenergy in order to support economic development in your country? So they thought we have three countries, India, China, and Philippines. Okay, so we have three types of uh, biomass, sugar rich, oil rich, and fast flow increase. Okay, so these are the three choices. Now these are the attributes. Energy security, for sugar rich, low domestic energy demand. Technology progress, high R&D investment in your country. Market structure, you have high market incentives. So this is one package. The second choice, oil crops. With oil crops, energy security, high domestic energy demand in your country. But your country have low R&D investment and you have low market incentives. And then the third, third choice, let's say for fast growing trees, you have low domestic energy supply anyway, high technology deployment, and you have good market infrastructure. 
Given these three choices and these attribute metals, you ask, how you respond, which one will you choose? So they will just ask, oh, I like the sugar rich crops, or I like the oil crops. So, now, another question. In this part of the survey, we provide you different imaginary social conditions that will result from bioenergy production. Given these conditions, which type of biomass will you choose to produce bioenergy in order to support social well-being in your country? So you have, again, the type of biomass is starch rich, agriculture, forest residues, and perennial grasses. And these are the attributes. For food security, starch rich, you will increase food self-sufficiency. Social welfare, increase livelihood sources. Social justice, it will hinder people property rights. So positive, positive, this is a big negative. No? So, now for this package, for the agriculture forest residues, food security, it will increase your purchasing power. You will have more money to buy food. Social welfare, you will have more job opportunities. Social justice, it will cause home displacement. So case also. The respondent will think about it. And then for perennial grasses, it will increase affordability of food. It will improve household lifestyle. And it, but it will cause land dispossession. Now, which of the three will you choose? This is something like this that they will make their preference choice. So that's why it's a choice task survey. Okay. So these different combinations is the software that is making these different combinations. Okay. So we have these three case study areas in China, India, and Philippines. In the Philippines, we have it in Batangas because we have the sugar cane. You know? And then in Quezon, in Mata Quezon, Coconut, probably. Sichuan in China and Tamil Nadu in India. Okay, more description on that one. So in the Philippines, okay. Batangas and Quezon are the main producers of sugar cane and coconut in the Calabasal region. Nasubu Batangas is the home of the plantation of several asuparela de Don Pedro. The Philippines' largest producer of sugar and other sugar cane products. In Infanta Quezon, uh, three biofuel processing plants are, are installed or developed in there with total capacity of 140 million liters per year when we conducted the survey. Okay. In India, so we have photos of Jetropa cultivation. This is the main source for the biodiesel. So, India. Okay, so we picked Tamil Nadu because farmers are cultivating Jetropa. Tamil Nadu, which is located in southern India, is one of the earliest states to have promoted biofuel promotion in India. Okay, it has the largest cultivator of Jetropa in India with more than 20,000 hectares cultivated with Jetropa. And then in China, our study area is Cook County in the province of Sichuan. Okay, it's an agricultural community. Uh, it's a least developing area in China. And then in this one, in the recent years, a number of biogas pools have been constructed in Muji, which uses species of crop residues to produce electricity. Or cocotisla. Okay. Now the results of our study. Okay. So how many respondents? So we'll be able to ask to answer the question. For the Philippines, we have about 250. 150 are from agriculture-related professions or farmers. Non-agriculture-related, we have 100. Academic researchers, NGOs. Okay. India, 90 and 70. China, 50 to 160. It is very difficult not to get respondents from India. Our collaborator, Dr. Gandhi, has so much difficulty. <coughs> Okay, these are some of the demographic characteristics of the respondents. For Philippines and China, majority of our respondents are below 30 years old. They are quite young. A few would be, this one would be the high level of emissions. In India, most of them are between 41 to 50, so they are a bit older. Okay, and most of them are farmers. Okay. For education, okay, so Philippines, most of them would have higher level of education. Okay, undergraduate and graduate degrees. The same thing also in uh, in China for the non-agriculture. But for the agriculture, they are mainly farmers in the in the rural areas, a okay, great school only. For India, they have also high level of education, similar to 
to the Philippines. And then for gender, for Philippines, we have almost balance no, between male and female for both ugly and non ugly sectors. In China, it's about two thirds would be male, one third female. But in India, majority are males. Nine more than two percent of respondents for both ugly and non ugly. Okay. Domicile, since in, in China, most of them are farmers, so many of them are in the urban, uh, no, in, sorry, here, in farm agriculture, 63%. For the Philippines, we have a majority um, in farm and agriculture, but also in urban uh, or city setting. The same thing with India. Place of work, so we try to have a good balance you know, from public agency, private and geos, field, farm, academic research, okay, for the three countries. Okay, now, okay, now this is very really important thing, okay, knowledge and sources of information on bioenergy, okay. Familiarity with the term bioenergy, are you familiar with this one? Okay, so in the Philippines, for both respondents, for both groups, very high familiarity with bioenergy. In India, they are even more familiar, 100% profile because that they use um, this um, by this subject profile. And China, for the non ugly 63%, but for the agricultural, for the farmers, they are not very much familiar with bioenergy. They just concentrate in their farming. Okay, work is your work related to bioenergy? Okay, so in the, in the Philippines, for the ugly sector, only 28%. But in India, they are sure, yes, more than 90 percent. In China, they are also not sure. So they are not aware, or maybe they just do not care if it's related to bioenergy. Okay. Bioenergy affects food security. In the Philippines, our uh, group from the agri sector, 62 percent of them, yes, it affects food security, bioenergy. For non agri only 40 percent. Okay. In India, 50 percent. In China, for the agricultural sector, they are not aware that bioenergy has an impact on the food security. For non agri about 50 percent. Bioenergy is good for your country. All respondents from the three countries, yes, said yes, so they are aware that in the future we have problems with fossil fuels and that bioenergy will be good for them. <coughs> Sources of information in the Philippines and also in India, mostly academic science will be high, and also media. In China, it's family for the farmers in the community, okay, the problem. And uh, for the not ugly, okay, the academic science will be a good source of information about bioenergy. Okay. With regards to perceptions of the contribution of these different energy sources and types of biomass, feed stock to economic growth, okay, by country, so Philippines. So we have here the agricultural related respondents and the non-agricultural. First generation, it means to say our food crops to be used, okay. Now for the oil rich crops, so we have, so take note for the colors, blue is low, low perception, medium, very high, they regard it as high contribution, very high contribution for the purple and the other group here do not know. So take note, in the Philippines for the non-agricultural sector, we have here very high for the oil rich crops and for the agricultural sector, we have here high and very high. So our respondents that are agriculture related, they have very, very high perception, they would say that uh, the oil rich crops, particularly our coconut oil, okay, has a big contribution in our bioenergy because it's a main source for our biodiesel. Okay. Second generation, okay, so we have here very high for fast growing trees. So that agriculture they would prefer okay, fast growing trees as well as bioenergy. And then for the others, high for farm farm forest. Farm of forest residues, fast growing trees, and very young. Now, in India, okay, so for them also, they have very high, okay, uh, perception about the oil rich crops. That is because of Chetropa in their country, the agricultural related respondents are very much aware of the importance of Chetropa, oil rich crop. Okay, for the non agricultural, they do not have much 
the uh, uh, preference for these different energy sources. Meaning they do not kill, maybe they do not, not very much aware of the importance. And for the second generation, okay, so they also have, except for the fast growing trees in agricultural, they say it's hard, okay? But then in other areas, they, they have a very little perception. In China, okay, so it's a bit different no, for the respondents from China. And we have also presented that in the paper. It's probably it's because we had so much difficulty getting a wider, um, a broader range of respondents because it's just limited to a small farming community who is who are not very much aware of the importance of bioenergy in and its relation to food production. That's why we have this scenario. So we have low perception of that one. And uh, except for the second generation for the fast growing trees, so it has high preference for the non agricultural sector. Okay, now with regards to the attributes of bioenergy on economic stability, so we have here Philippines. In the Philippines, so okay, the green one is type of biomass, energy security for orange. The gray one is technology progress, and the blue one is market structure. So you will notice here that in the Philippines, we have greater area for market structure. So let me say, uh, in the Philippines, our respondents think that having a good market structure will attain economic stability for bioenergy production. Okay. Then the next one will be the type of biomass that we are going to use. Okay. In India, okay, so the type of biomass Okay. Um, they prefer, they have high preference for this one. And for the non-agricultural respondents, they have also high preference for energy security. Okay. In China, okay, so they have uh, energy security followed by the type of um, as the uh, major attributes to attain uh, bioenergy sustainability in terms of economic stability. In terms of social equity, okay, in the Philippines, so we have here the green one, social welfare. So it is actually higher for the non-agricultural uh, related respondents. So social welfare followed by food security. These are the major attributes. Okay. For the respondents from, from India, the type of biomass and food security are the major determinants. And then for China, they you know it's more of social justice and social welfare. That is because they are mainly, mainly concerned with, so, with their social displacement, with the conversion of their agricultural farms in, for food production to biofuel production. Ecological balance, okay. In the Philippines, our respondents would uh, have, they have high preference for land management and ecosystem capacity. Okay, actually, production potential is also high. This is almost balanced no, for the three. Okay. In India, again, you have high preference for type of biomass. In China, land management and ecosystem capacity are major um, uh, attributes that they that they have high preference in terms of ecological balance. Now, okay. Now, this is a radar diagram to integrate the those different preferences, okay, uh, from the three countries. It's, it, we can easily compare. So, basically, when we look at this radar diagram, we just take a look at which leg uh, is longer. So, like for example, for the green one, that is China. For we have the three um, points here, three corners. Ecosystem capacity, energy security, and food security. So these are for the agriculture-related respondents. So from China, okay, they put a much higher weight for energy security. So it's a major concern for the Chinese respondents, energy security. Okay. For India, it's more for food security. Okay. And for the Philippines, the blue one, it's both uh, food security and also ecosystem capacity. Now this is the respondent, the scenario for the agricultural related respondents. How about the other group? 
that are not related to agriculture. Okay? So the orange one, again, is for India. Again, even from this group, food security is a major concern. Okay? The green one for China is energy security. And for the Philippines, it's again food security for the non-agriculturality. So you see, we can take a look here, we can compare the different preferences of the different respondents from the different countries. You know? Others would prefer more for food security. For India, it's more of energy security. And for the Philippines, since we are, we are also very much concerned not only for food, but also for ecosystems. Um, uh, stability, you know, because we know that our country uh, we have so much environmental degradation, so erosion, flooding, and so on. So ecosystem capacity is also a major concern for the respondents from the Philippines. Okay, so in conclusion, the results of the conjoint analysis indicated that the preferred value energy feedstock and its role in sustainable development reflects the social and economic concerns in the respective Asian countries, that is, energy security in China, where we would require high energy because of the research, fast development, food security in India, okay, because you know, we have to see these cars in India, and ecosystem degradation in the Philippines. Overall, there is also significant awareness on the effects of bioenergy on ecological balance not only in the Philippines, but also both in India and China, as revealed by the references on the determinants such as ecosystem capacity and land management. Okay. The high preference for energy security as in the case of China may thus overshadow other sustainability issues such as ecosystem degradation. The same as preferred energy. Okay. Thus, policy should carefully weigh the impacts of bioenergy development on sustainability issues that are closely interlinked, the energy food ecosystem nexus. Because the society may favor one or two sustainability issues at the cost of another issue. That is the trade-offs. Okay. And then I just got this one, the water energy food nexus. So we have here the energy, food, and water. So for uh, sustainable uh, people, landscape, and ecosystems, there should be a balance. So the policies should really take a look into this one. Like for example, here, the entry point here for energy security, governance, and investment. Okay. So for energy, so we have here demand, supply, and assets. Okay. Now our food here, okay. so food production, processing, and transport need energy. So that goes to food production. Okay. So fossil fuel extraction, energy crops, and carbon sequestration impact food supply. Okay, so the entry point here is food security, what will be the policy, government policy, and investments. Okay, so that we so that it can have it can meet the demand, you know, the supply can meet the demand, and we still have assets for food production. So water infrastructure and uh, use impacts on fish stocks food supply, and land use. And then we have here water, okay? Water, we have demand, we demand supply and access. Okay, food production means clean water, and impacts on clean water quality and availability. Okay, so because you have food, fertilizer, pesticides, it can pollute the water resources, okay? And then, in, so the entry point here for water security would be management and investment, okay? So we have here, so water, we have demand, we have supply assets, and then we go to this one, energy production, including sequestration, needs water. And impacts on water quality and availability. So that's why for sustainable development, we really have to consider this water, energy, food nexus. Okay. I think that's it. And if you're interested, we have published already this paper, so you can, you can take it from agriculture in 2016. The role of bioenergy in enhancing energy, food, and ecosystem sustainability based on societal perceptions and preferences in Asia. So, thank you very much.